William I Marquis really was responsible for beginning the terraces, and we know by 1685 there was a lot of planting going on, and the terraces were being built. Um, and we think, pretty sure, that the ar architect involved was a William Wind, who was responsible also for certainly the construction of his house in London. The whole thing revolved around showing off to one's peers and others that I can do this and this is the power I have over my, my landscape. If you were building a garden, at that time it had to be formal. And then the terrain of, of Wales couldn't go for the French style because it was so flat. They preferred to have avenues. So it had to be more of the Italian. So the terracing, the balustrading, the whole construction would have been picking up that particular style. The castle itself is a great edifice showing the dominance of the countryside, but the landscape which would have fallen away from that was probably rather meagre um, in the style that a, a great country seat should have. And therefore, let's have a link something that the lords and ladies of Italy, France might be proud of, let's do it here too. So it was a fashion we imported. The effect really, as you would look up towards the castle, the castle would still tend to dominate. It's this huge red edifice on the top of the hill that would still have dominated. But below we'd have had the arches of the niches, the formality of these clipped obelisk shaped yews coming from it tier after tier of terracing with balustrading. We've also got wonderful statuary going in. Hercules slaying the Hydra, which is still on the top terrace now. It's imposing now when you stand on the great lawn and look up um, in a different way, but then it must have been awe-inspiring. These strangely shaped hedges are rather famous at Poes. Over the centuries, they have been allowed to bulge naturally, but the gardeners still have to cope with them somehow. It's a tough job. Hedge cutting is still done almost traditionally in the sense that you have to work off ladders because these wonderful shapes and the, the terracing doesn't allow cherry pickers and scaffolding. So the character of the place is sustained really because of the gardeners that, that keep it going by hand, pruning and tending just as they did 100, 200 years ago. The way we look after the gardens today, certainly compared to how they might have been 100 or 200 years ago, is one very, very different factor is that we've got hundreds of thousands of people coming to visit us. So that has a different sort of pressure. Um, there are nine gardeners that full-time work in the garden. Uh, we have a nursery which employs two people full-time. Um, there are three months of uh, hedge cutting, uh, almost solidly for four people. If you walk around the grounds, you'll come across all these little tombstones all over the place. It's quite macabre in a way. And on each tombstone is the name of a dog. And there's a sort of a tradition of burying dogs. The sixth Earl had a dog called Satan. Um, he was also buried here. I'm never quite sure whether the National Trust named him that or whether he was originally named that because he used to eat chairs. So he wasn't terribly popular, I think. There are all sorts of dogs buried there, and most recently, at this conference that we have down in the field, a couple had a dog with them and the dog died. And I said there was a tradition for burying dogs, so they buried their dog in the park. It doesn't have a stone yet, but uh, so they've joined the tradition there. That isn't an invitation to everybody to bury their dog here, though. <laughs> <laughs>